Okay. So today we are going to continue our conversation on memory. Last time we were here, we did memory one, in which we looked at memory hierarchy and the principle of locality, right? So having multi-tiered memory, uh, what did we have? Cache, very, very close to the processor so that the bandwidth between the processor and the cache memory can be really high. Memory accesses can be super fast. Don't find it in the cache, go to the memory. Don't find it in the memory, have to get things from the slow hard disk. Um, now, that was in terms of instructions, data, everything. Um, and we, we were only talking about uh, one kind of address, which was the physical address. Right? The last time we met, we just talked about one address in memory that we were trying to access. Today, we are going to see um, what are some problems if we just talk about a physical address. A physical address is what? Oh, let's do this. A physical address is like physical cash, right? Physical cash, as opposed to having Bitcoin, right? So that, that's sort of your uh, uh, comparison between a physical address and a virtual address. So we'll, we'll first try to look at what are some of the problems if we just deal with physical addresses. We'll find the need for a virtual address and then we'll see how we implement this in our memory system with those levels of hierarchy while leveraging uh, lo uh, temporal and spatial locality. So if you look at just the bare machine, which is essentially our data path, you have your program counter over here that is generating a physical address. You have your instruction cache, a decode stage, ALU to execute the instruction, and then you have your data cache. All of these elements, along with their uh, interstage pipeline buffers in the middle, they are all recognizing only one type of address, which is a physical address. Physical address, in other words, a real address, right? And what is that address for? It is for a location in memory that you are either reading from or writing to. Then there is a memory controller that is going to facilitate the communication between those caches, instruction and data cache, with your main memory, which is based off of the technology dynamic RAM. So that's a memory controller. Everybody is understanding what? There's only a physical address, right? Everybody talks physical address. There's a problem with that. So in the bare machine, the only kind of address is a physical address. The problem is that we are going to run uh, into a problem where, and this is not in any order, there are several problems. Not enough physical memory. Because physical memory is real memory, you will uh, have limitation on the size of the memory. So typically you, you might uh, hear what? Nowadays you hear 8 gig RAM and 16 gig RAM. But with those 8 gig RAM and 16 gig RAM, you can have a bigger, a lot bigger virtual address space, even in hundreds of gigs. But that's virtual, that's not real. What you buy is a physical RAM which is a few gigs. So the, the question over here is, what if our programs needed four gigs of dynamic RAM, but what was available to us in physical RAM was only one gig, then what, what do you do? Well, you give an illusion to the user that you actually have four gigs, but in reality only have one gig, right? So it's like money in your bank account. Well, how much money do you have? Well, you, I can make up any number, right? Because it's just, a number on a screen. But when it comes to, okay, put that money on the table, then I'm in trouble because I have to put it. That's, that's real money. But as long as it's a number that's showing up digitally when I log into my account, I can say any number, right? Look, it just became a million. It just became two million, right? Like it, it's just a number, arbitrary. So it's, that's the, that's the uh, comparison between a virtual physical memory address and what you see in, in like when you log into your bank account. So the question is here, four gigs. What would you need four gigs for? Well, you have a lot of programs that are running in parallel, simultaneously, right? And those programs will be present in your main memory, main memory because you need to access uh, instructions, you need to access the data to support those instructions, and then you need to store those instructions to memory. So because you have a lot of programs, you will need a lot amount of RAM. And the limitation is, physically, you have 
a smaller space, one gig. Now, next problem is how do we share main memory between different programs? Well, let's suppose program one comes in, it occupies uh, some physical memory, then it goes away. Not all of it, but some of it goes away. You bring in program two, goes away, brings in program three. How is it going to look like? Well, it's going to be a messy physical memory, right? Because some parts of various programs are going in and out of physical memory. What you will have is holes. Holes in the dynamic RAM due to the order of program execution. Holes just means a physical frame or physical uh, space in the phys uh, physical memory, the real memory. So it's going to look very messy, right? Uh, you have a frame from program one, then you have a frame from program two, then you have two frames that are empty, then you have a frame from program five. It's not organized. It's a very messy physical memory. But even if our physical memory is messy, because we are doing things virtually, we can keep the virtual address space very clean, right? So that's, in, that's going to allow us to have a very, very clean look of our uh, programs, what, what, what is being used right now. Now, next problem, what if multiple programs access the same address? So you have the same address. Let us say program two and program three are trying to read from or write to the same address, right? So if you're trying to read from the same address, as long as those programs have write access to that same location, what you can do is you can map their virtual addresses that they are requesting to the same physical address. So this way, data. but if multiple programs were accessing the same address, you could have data corruption. Now, with the concept of virtual memory, we can have a me mechanism to separate those memory accesses. So the key problem in all of this is what? M programs are accessing the same physical memory space. The solution to this is each program gets its own virtual space. Each program is getting its own virtual space. Now, because it is virtual, we can keep everything the way we want. Very clean, no holes, very organized. Now, in terms of memory management, it has three independent functions or orthogonal functions. One is translation. And we'll spend a lot of time today talking about that particular function of translation. What are you translating? You're trying to translate or map a virtual address to a physical address. So the CPU, if it generates a virtual address, then there has to be some table, there has to be some translation that maps that virtual address to a physical address. Because when you go down to the main memory, they, it only understands uh, the, the real address, the, the physical address. It doesn't un understand virtual. So you need some layer that does that translation for you. Next, protection. Perm permission to access a word in the memory. Does a particular program have a per permissions to read a word in the memory? Write or both, read and write. That's another orthogonal function. The third one is the virtual memory itself, which is essentially a transparent extension of our memory space. And what we are doing is, we are using this virtual memory space so that we have a lot more address space than that is limited. For example, four gigs instead of one gig. Now, most modern systems use what? A single page based system. A page you're going to hear this term page uh, several times today and in fact in the next couple of lectures. A page is uh, a contiguous block of virtual memory, fixed length, contiguous block of uh, virtual memory. So it can have different uh, sizes. A page in the memory can, uh, can be four kilobytes, eight KB, 64 KB. So for bigger applications, it's gonna be bigger. For embedded applications, for example, you can go down to uh, one kilobyte. So you have 
most modern system will have a single page based system where you have uh, a, a, a page table that is managing the translation between a virtual address and a physical address. And there are pages in the virtual space mapping to frames in the physical memory. All of these things, once you start looking at um, you know, how memory accesses happen, you see page tables in action, all of these things will become even, uh, even more clear. Now, what does a processor generate? Well, the processor, the CPU, it has two choices, right? It can generate a virtual address or it can generate a physical address. Well, if it generates a physical address, then you're down to the same problem. Then you're not even left using virtual memory at all. So what you're doing is you're allowing that processor for a specific, while executing a specific pro program, you're allowing it to generate a virtual address. That virtual address has two fields. One is the page number. There are several pages for a program, page zero, page one, page two, page three. Which page are you talking about? A page is what? Contiguous length of virtual memory. Fixed length, fixed length contiguous block of physical memory. And you also have an offset field in that. Why do you need that offset? Well, a page of memory, like I said, 4 KB, 64 KB, and so on, right? So it has several kilobytes. Which byte did you want to access? To know which byte out of that page, you need the offset. So offset is essentially a field that denotes which byte from the start of the page are you trying to access. So which page and in that, which byte, right? So you have two fields for that. This is a virtual address uh, that the processor is generating. Now let's take a look how it, uh, a virtual address maps to a physical address. This is for program one, right? So on the left here, we have the virtual address space of program one and it has certain pages, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Just as an example, a very organized, right? 0, 1, and 2, and 3. Very in line, organized, no holes, right? No, no, no empty pages in the middle. This is all virtual, so we can, we can arrange it the way we want. Then you have a page table. What does a page table say? Page table does the first orthogonal function, which is the translation. So you tell me a virtual address, I will tell you the corresponding physical address for that. So a page table does the translation or the mapping between a virtual address and a physical address. So you look up, say you want to look up page one, right? So I'm trying to access page one. Where do I look? I will look over here. This, whatever you have over here in the page table, it will have a, a frame number. Right, it'll have a frame number or entry over here. That frame number will point me to this guy, the start of the page. From there, I will be able to look at the offset field, which is going to be the same for virtual and physical, to go and look at which, which particular byte I'm trying to access in that particular page. So you, all the way to the right, you can see uh, the, the physical memory, it has holes over here, uh, the pages are not organized, zero is going here, one is going here, two is going here, three is going here. Not just that, when you start putting it, putting in other programs, how is it going to look? Maybe for program two, you may have page zero of program two go here, page one of program two go here, and so on, right? In fact, you could have the same virtual address map to uh, sorry, the, the different virtual address map to the same physical address. You can also ma maintain that because of the existence of page tables that manage that mapping. So what are page tables? Page tables are essentially tables with two entries, right? So it, not entries, I should say, uh, they are responsible for the mapping. You give me a virtual page number, I will tell you the frame number corresponding to that. That's all they do, they do, they do the mapping. They will also let you know whether the information that you're looking for, whether the page that you're looking for is present in the dynamic RAM or you will have to spend time looking at it in the hard disk, right? Uh, and they do that by a valid bit. If valid bit is zero, you know that it is not in the physical memory. 
if valid bit is one, then you know it's in the physical memory. Uh, so what are page tables making possible? Page tables make it possible to store the pages of a program non-contiguously, right? So you can store it anywhere you want, but the page tables, because they are managing that translation, you, you can do that. You can have a messy physical memory. Now we are trying to add more programs to this. So all the way on the left, you have virtual address space for program one, virtual address space for program two, virtual address space for program three. Each program gets its own page table. You have page table for program one, two, and three over here. What are the page tables doing? They are doing the translation. So every uh, page for every program is mapped to a physical frame. So all the way on the right, we have the physical memory, the real memory, the dynamic RAM. It has some pages for operating system. It has some free pages in the middle. And then after that, they are color coded. The pink ones are corresponding for program two. The, the green ones are corresponding to program three and so on. So as you can see, the physical memory, it is a mess, right? Like it's, it's, it's a very messy, fragmented memory with holes in it. Um, but what is clean for a programmer, this is what is clean, the virtual address space because of the existence of page table, you can have a, uh, so all we need to maintain is the page table, right? Just to get that mapping. So each program has its own page table. The page table contains an entry for each program page. Now, we also need to look at the, the details of the virtual address and the physical address. I said page number and offset, right? So let's look at those things in a little bit more detail. So all the way to the top here, we have a virtual address. Who talks virtual address? CPU talks virtual address, right? So, so the CPU generates a virtual address, but by the time you get to the main memory, it has to be, in order to talk to the main memory, you need a physical address. Now, at this point, I hope you guys are wondering, okay, where does cache fit in all, in all of this, right? You're talking about a virtual address, and then you have a, you are talking about main memory. Where does cache fit in all of this? The issue with the cache, right now just, just ignore the cache because we are gonna put the cache in at, the, at a later stage, almost at the end of our lecture today. The reason is you have choices. You can have a, a CPU generate a virtual address and access the cache first, or you can have the CPU generate a virtual address with which you don't access the cache first, you go access the page table first. So you have a couple of options in what you access first. Right now, so we, we are ignoring cache for now. We are just looking at physical memory accesses. So let's go back. Virtual address, who generates that CPU? How many bit is your virtual address right now? It looks like the virtual address space starts at zero, least significant bit here, and 31, right? So it's a 32-bit virtual address space. How much is what does that correspond to in terms of bytes? Virtual address space is how big? Four? Four gigs, right? Virtual address space equals two raised to 32, which will give you four gigs. The 32-bit address. And similarly, for the physical address space, what do you have? physical address space, two raised to zero to 29, 30, which is a factor of four less, right? One gig for physical, four gig for virtual. Now, I also want you guys to notice the page offset in the virtual address is exactly the same as the page offset in the physical address. 12 bits over there, 12 bits over here. The page offset doesn't change across all the memory hierarchies. It is going to be set. And what is it going to determine? What is page offset used to used for? It is used for 
which byte are you trying to access within a page, right? And there are 12 bits over here to do that. Do you think we can calculate the page size using that? What would be the page size? I need 12 bits to pick a byte out of a page. So how many bytes is it going to be? Well, 2 raised to 12, right? What is that? Because it's 12 bits. Uh, so if you take out the 4 from 2 raised to 2, you're left with 2 raised to 10. 4 KB. So this is a four kilobyte page, and it has a physical address space of one gig and a virtual address space of four gig. Now, I want you guys to tell me how many physical pages do you have? Number of physical pages. Physical pages is kind of a confusing term, uh, because when they are physical, you refer to them as frames. In virtual, you refer to them as pages. Uh, so a physical page is a frame. So how many physical pages do you have? You have how many bits to, uh, to number a physical page? So it starts at 12, ends at 29. So 18 bits are being used to reference each physical page number, right? Page zero, page one, page two, page three, page four, and so on. And you have 18 bits to do that. So it would be two raised to 18, right? Let's see that. Now, who does this translation? You have a virtual page number, to a physical page number. Who does that translation? Because we need to translate that. Page table is going to do that, right? Page table is going to have the information about that translation. You tell me the page number, I will tell you the frame number. If the entry is in the page table, maybe you will have a page table miss, which is called a page fault. That could also happen. All right, let's go look at uh, more things now. Now, for a specific program, the CPU would generate a virtual page number, right? I'm trying to access page two. Then where do you look first? Well, you have to do the translation first. So you go look in the page table. Page table are going to tell you two things. One is the translation, is the mapping information present or not? Well, if you are accessing this guy, the valid bit is one, so you know that the mapping is there. So for the requested page number, you will have information about the frame number, which is physical. So you look at the frame number, and you go access the top of the frame over there. And along with the uh, offset, which is part of your address space, the, uh, the, the offset maps directly, right? It doesn't need to be translated. It, it just gets copied over. We, using the page offset, you will look for the byte within that page in the physical memory. Now, the other possibility is you are looking for a page number which is not present in the page table. The mapping is not present in the page table. So what do you do then? Well, if you have, if you have a page fault in that case, now you've got to look at the disk st storage, the slow hard disk. Right now, so what do you do? You you have to when you go look at the the disk storage. You have to pick one. So you, two things can happen. You need to bring that particular frame from here to here, and then update the page table with a one, right? Because now it's there in the physical memory. But when you bring this from here to here, two two things can happen. You may have an empty page to fit that, or all the physical memory is full, right? There's no more space. What do you do then? Well, you will have to pick one frame to kick out. 
And the way you kick it out is by putting it into a swap space of the disk storage. You call it swap space. And you might ha have seen that while you are looking at properties of a computer. What is the swap space and all that? that that's what it is. Right. We'll take a look at all of these things with animations in a little bit. But those are the things that pay. Virtual page number from a CPU for a particular program. Uh, you look at the translation in the page table. Valid bit can be a zero, can be a one. If it is one, good news. You get the corresponding frame number information already. Go look at that particular uh, address, physical address. You will also need the page offset, which just carries over from the virtual address space, because it's going to be the same. Um, and then you get you re return that particular information to the CPU because you have accessed the real uh, physical memory. If the valid bit is zero, then you have to go look in the disk bring that particular frame into the physical memory, update the page table, give the information back to the, uh, restart the instruction so that uh, uh, you can access that data. Next, let's take a look at the virtual ad uh, address. What does the virtual address have? Adr virtual address space has a very, very clean look. It's not fragmented. It has page several pages. Uh, for a particular uh, program, right? page 0, page 1, page 2, so on up to page m minus 1. So the addresses over here, if you assume that you have 2 raised to 32 words, the addresses are going to go from 0 to 2 raised to 32 minus 1. 32 being your uh, virtual address space is being referenced with a 32-bit virtual address. It's going to be big and clean. The way we had, the example that we saw was what? 4 gigs of virtual space. It was big. And but because it is virtual, we are able to manage it the way we want, keep it clean. It's going to be big, hundreds of gigs or terabytes. So the, for the programmer, it, they need to think about virtual addresses. They don't think about physical addresses. Now, the illusion is what? The illusion is use this really big space, uh, but at the... Behind the uh, scenes, you have a small physical memory. So you have several pages, m minus one, but any at any given time in the physical memory, it is limited. You only have cap n number of frames. Clearly, m is going to be much bigger than n, right? Because the physical memory is limited. So physical memory installed in the dynamic RAM is going to be smaller tens of gigs, it's going to be messy and fragmented. We saw multiple programs that, are, they were, that were interleaved, holes in the middle, operating system pages are also there, so everything is sort of a mess there. But as long as you are in the virtual address space, everything is clean. Um, so the illusion, the goal here is to create that illusion of a big, clean virtual address space, but behind the scenes, you are only using a small amount of physical dynamic RAM storage. You guys see how the mapping is going to work, right? So yeah, I have a page table, right? So the page table can take in any value and can point me. So just think about it like this. If you just had one entry in the physical memory, but you had four entries in the virtual address space, I can have a page table for all these four entries, but I can map them to the same address in the memory, right? So that's like four is to one gain for me. You guys see that? So the page table is doing that, playing that trick in the middle with that translation. So it's an illusion uh, to the user. Now let's start, take a look at some of the terminology because now we have gone from a memory hierarchy concept to a, the concept of the virtual memory. Some of the terminology has uh, changed. So what we'll do here is we will use the terminology for caches as a reference to learn about the terminology for virtual memory. So what did we say about the uh, closest to the CPU uh, level? It was the cache, right? Now, in terms of virtual memory, what is going to be the thing that we access for the translation? Page table. Page table is going to have that mapping from virtual address to the physical address. And that's what you need to look at to get that translation. Oh, by the way, where is the page table located? Page table is actually located in the physical memory, which is a bad news, by the way. So right now, this is a bad news. Page table is 
located in physical memory in the dynamic ram and for for so for every program the start of the page table for a particular program the location of where is the uh, where is the page table for program 1 where is the page table for program 2 there is a register called page table register that has the location of the page table for each program page table that's called a page table register so page table is located in the physical physical memory so now think about this if you are talking if your if your cpu is generating a virtual address and you are trying to say read the memory right you are trying to read the memory reading the main memory then you are not reading the main memory once you are actually reading the main memory twice one for the translation the second one for the actual data to to read to be read right so that's uh, that's a that's a negative which we are trying going to try to overcome later on so we had a cache in our previous lecture now we have page tables to look at the mapping now with the cache if you don't find the information in the cache what did you say i have a miss in the cache right well if you don't find the the mapping that you are looking for in the page table then that would result in a page fault page fault happens when the valid bit is a zero in, for that particular mapping go look in the disk miss rate what is the miss rate number of accesses to the cache that result in a miss the ratio right misses by total number of memory accesses to the cache that would be a miss rate similarly for the pages it would be page fault rate the number of accesses to the page table that result in a page fault divided by the total number of page uh, table accesses so that ratio is your page fault rate what were you uh, replacing in the cache as you were bringing things in and out of the cache you were dealing with blocks of memory block being a, a combination of words now you have pages that are being mapped so you are talking about page numbers in this case earlier we were talking about when we were looking at the physical address in a in the context of cache we had two bytes all the way to the right two bits sorry to two bits to pick out a particular byte in a word right we we call that the byte offset in this case in virtual memory we have page offset it is still doing the same thing trying to pick out a byte but now it is from the whole page caches are your pure hardware implementation while your virtual memory is managed by your uh, operating system uh, software combination of cpu hardware and the operating system uh, software next page tables in action this is an animation which means that i'm not going to draw this uh, over here but instead i'm going to share my screen here so that you guys can see me work through this on powerpoint here here let us see if you guys can see this as well yes you guys can see this as well uh, let's do this okay uh, can move this down here and can i get a pointer sure okay so let's walk through some uh, demos of how these page tables work so on this slide what do you have cpu that generates a virtual address in this case we are considering a 32 bit virtual address it needs to be mapped to a physical address here you have your physical memory based off of dram technology then you have a disk area over here your secondary storage the slow uh, slow memory here in the middle of the slide you have the page table that is going to have the mapping between each page there are n pages in this case and a frame number right so that's that's sort of how we are going to start off the cpu is going to generate that 32 bit virtual address which comprises of two things page number and offset page number is going that field is going to be able how many entries can you have here you can have 0 1 2 and so on up to n minus 1 right so you need to talk about a page number so you have you need to have 
enough number of bits in the page number uh, field in order to exhaust all these options, zero all the way down to n minus one. You see that, so if cap n was 32, and you were going from zero to 31, how many bits would you need in the page number field? You would need five bits in that case, right? So pick one out of the five options, uh, 32 options. And then you have the offset field, which will be used to point to a particular byte within that page. So that's what the CPU generates. As soon as I have a virtual address, I'm going to look at my page table to get the translation done, to get the physical memory. Right now, I have already accessed the main memory once, right? Because page tables are in the main memory. And I got lucky here because whatever page I was looking for, the corresponding entry has a valid bit of one, which means I have the information in the page table and I can get the corresponding frame number information right away from the page table. So what do I do? I fill in that particular frame number information in the physical address. The offset is not going to change. The same offset, the last 12 bits in our example are going to get copied over to the physical address. That makes in, you know, earlier we had a 32-bit virtual address and a 30-bit 30, 30 physical address, right? So we, we now have the frame number. We also have the, the page offset. Look at the physical memory. You, have, you were able to access the location, which have whatever location that the CPU wanted to uh, uh, read or write, now you are able to access that information. That gets returned to the CPU. Now, the other possibility is also uh, possible, right? The, the other possibility is when you looked at the page table, the valid bit was zero, but you had a disk address usually is a disk address or disk area, DA, it's referenced as. So in this case, you don't have the frame number information. What you need to look at is the disk, because if the valid bit is zero, then you had a, almost like a miss in the page table, right? That's called a page fault. So when you have a page fault, then you need to go look at that specific uh, disk address. So when the valid bit is zero, you don't get a frame number, you get a disk address. You go look at that disk address. You need to bring that into the physical memory. Well, two things can happen. One, physical memory has space. You can do that job very quickly, easily. Physical memory doesn't have space, so you have to bump out a frame using that swap space. Put that in there and then bring your disk area. Usually the swap space can, uh, maintains all the all of the dynamic RAM, so all the frames that you have in the dynamic RAM, they are present in the swap space. Questions with the page tables in action? Generate a virtual address, go look in the page table, can have it in the physical memory, may not have it in the physical memory. Uh, if it doesn't have the physical memory, then it's a disk address. Go look at it in the uh, hard disk. When you look at it in the hard disk, you need to bump a frame or use an empty frame to bring that entry to the physical memory, update the page table, restart that particular access to the same virtual memory. All right, let's take a look at another example here. Um, this can be a little bit confusing because we are using uh, not information, but we are referencing each page with a letter, A through H. So let's try to see how, how this is going to work. All the way to the left, you have, all the way to the left, you have a virtual space for a particular program. In the middle, you have your page table giving you the mapping or the translation. You have a small physical memory. In this case, it can hold only four frames or four pages. And then you have a big, slow, disk. Now, you can see that this particular program has eight pages, and they are marked A through H. Some of them um, have their uh, mapping present over here, and some of them don't. 
currently in the physical memory there are four pages that are referenced in uh, marked b a e and f and there are some other pages that are only in the disk there are two pages that are not in the disk and not in the uh, physical memory so let's take a look at what happens here suppose you are trying to access say page 0 right if you if you are program generated a virtual address that corresponded to accessing page 0 what would happen well you you need page 0 right where do you look you look over here for the translation when you look over here valid bit is one good news i got frame number 1 and the disk area or disk address is also one it's also here but i'm not, not going to use it here i'm just going to look at the frame number and i know whatever i have Th that marked space is going to tell me the data at that particular physical address so that i can return to the cpu uh, suppose i was so next let's take an example where we are trying to access page three if you are accessing page three uh, you look at the page table valid bit is zero so the, there's no frame number available information available there but we have the disk area disk address four available so what do you do you look over here you have to bring this over here so you have to pick a frame to kick out which is topic of our next lecture which is titled page replacement algorithms right which page should i replace b a e f right and what should i base it on should i base it on least recently used or first in first out well, like how should i uh, pick out the frame that gets kicked out so that's the topic of our next lecture but i will pick a frame to kick out and then i'll bring d in there and I'll update the page page table um how many things are in the physical memory well four frames zero one two and three you can look at that zero one two and three where are they zero is here one is here two is here three is here so for all those frames the valid bit is one yeah they are also in the disk area as well right so a a b e f a b e f they are also in the disk uh, the other option is it is not there in the physical memory but it is there in the disk that is like for what disk a that for page number 3 uh, that's it for page number 3 and 2 right so page number 3 and page number 2 it is not present in the physical memory but it is present in the disk there is another problem that i hope you have noticed so far there are entries in the page uh, there are entries in the virtual space for a particular program that are not in the physical memory not in the disk what happens then suppose you are trying to access page 6 or we are trying to access page 7 well you look at the page table page table says valid bit is zero valid bit is zero all right so let's take a look at the disk area disk address none available what do you do then well that is an invalid reference you abort the program because that is not, that you have tried to access something that doesn't belong to that program so we are using a through h those letters as just to uh, mark those uh, specific pages questions here <laughs> How do you handle a page fault? Suppose you are trying to execute this particular instruction. Load word. Load word is a memory uh, instruction, right? It reads the memory. So CPU is trying to load a word, which means that I have to uh, bring in something from the physical memory into uh, uh, a particular register file. And I've given it, uh, the, the details of this instruction doesn't matter, but what we are doing is base address is in register 10, offset is 100, you add them to get the base address, and that's what you're trying to access. Um, but that is a virtual address, right? So a virtual address needs to be get translated to the physical address. So if you're, the CPU is trying to load a word, it is trying to access the memory, is going to look at it look at the page table first you look at the page table looks like the valid bit is zero and you have to look at the disk address entry corresponding to that 
So word is not in the dynamic RAM because the valid bit is zero. If the valid bit is zero and you have the corresponding disk address, then the, it is a trap addressing error to the operating system. So the operating, state, operating system initiates a trap addressing error. In return, it initiates a disk input output operation because I need to bring that particular, using that disk address information, I need to bring that frame from the disk to the physical memory. You are gonna to try to find an empty frame. If you don't find an empty frame, then you need to kick out a used frame and then put that page there from the disk to the, the physical memory. Now, what do you have? You have to do update the page table, right? Update the page table. This will become a one. And then you restart the instruction. Now, the second time when you do this, you're going to find the page table. You're going to find this. Uh, it's not going to be disk address anymore. It's going to be a frame number and you get the information right away. The, the problem, however, is too many memory accesses, right? Um, and it seems very useless that I'm spending time just for the translation, for that mapping, I'm accessing the main memory, right? So a better option is, as we built a cache for the RAM, let us try to build a translation buffer for our page table, right? So page table, so think of it like this, cache and RAM, right? And so like that, for our translation purposes, we can have page table in the physical memory, a smaller page table that is closer to the CPU, we are, we'll call that some other name, we'll have that close to the CPU so that the translation can also have a hierarchy. First, go ahead. It'll have both, right? So if it, the valid bit is one, then it'll have both entries as long as the disk is doing a complete swap, right? So the, some, usually that's what happens where the hard disk has a swap space, which is keeping everything that is in the physical memory is in that swap space. So like you have essentially two copies of that. Uh, so if that is the case, then every one in the valid bit will have both the frame and the disk. It's not a requirement, but they will, both will be there. Uh, but if the hard disk is using a swap space only for a limited number of uh, pages, then you may have the frame number, you may not have the disk, uh, disk address location. Very rare to find that. Other questions? All right. Now let's try to do some calculations here. These are going to look uh, pre pretty similar to the kind of calculations that you have seen before. Uh, this is assuming that we are looking at a cache for the information first. If, and if you are trying to access something in the memory, you are looking at it in the cache first. You can have a cache hit or you can have a cache miss. If you have a cache hit, then the access time so far has been, say, C nanoseconds. But if you have a miss in the cache, depending on the miss rate, which is one minus the hit rate, then you can respond to it by looking at things in the memory. And if you don't find things in the memory, then essentially you are, dealing, you are going to have to deal with a page fault. So for the miss rate amount of time, if small p is your page fault rate, then one minus p is going to be the rate at which you will find things in the memory. The access time for that is going to be C plus M. Where is the C coming from? Well, C is because you spent time looking at it in the cache first. And because you missed it, you spent M in the memory. Now, if you don't find it in the memory, then you have a cap T nanosecond, which is going to be your disk access time in comparison is going to be huge. Uh, but you do that for page fault rate, small p amount of time. This is assuming that you're looking at it in the cache first, then memory, then hard disk.
Now, real world page tables have a lot of entries. We have talked about what? Only three of them, valid bit, uh, frame number, and the disk uh, uh, area or disk address. It, it actually has a lot of uh, more entries. Uh, the first thing that we need to point out, one page table for each program. Why is that a good idea? You can have a clean virtual address space for each program. By maintaining the page table separately for each program, you can monitor, uh, you can facilitate many to one mapping, right? Like many virtual addresses for different programs being mapped to one physical address. You can, you can manage that using that page table. Uh, by having separate page tables for each program, you are making sure that they never collide, right? Like virtual addresses are never going to collide. Uh, because of that. Now, typical entries in the page table, you have valid bit, the same as your uh, valid bit in the cache. Valid bit is one, indicates the frame information is there. Zero, it's not there, could be in the disk. Dirty bit is one. Well, another bit where if it is one, that indicates that the page that you accessed is got modified by the CPU. So that is your dirty bit. Uh, reference or use, another um, structure in the memory that can be used for uh, replacement algorithms, like the least recently used pages. So, uh, as the physical pages are getting replaced, not enough mem uh, space in the physical memory, I need to bump out a frame. Which frame to bump out? Reference or use information can help with that. Protection bits. So, pages are they having read or uh, are, do programs have read access to it, read write access to it or write access to it? This is going to be very important when multiple processors are trying to share the same page. Physical number, uh, frame number, that is obvious. Page table entry, valid, and then frame number, which is your physical page number. Uh, and then the last one is your disk address or disk area, location on the disk, right? So, so far we have seen valid bit, frame number and location of the disk. We are adding three in the middle over here dirty bit, reference or use uh, structure, and your protection bits. So we'll spend some time talking uh, more about uh, the translation. Now, next, we need to look at the translation getting fast. Why do we need it to be fast? Page table is in the physical memory. So every time I'm accessing the physical memory, every, every time I'm trying to read a memory, I'm doing two memory accesses, right? One for the page table translation, another to actually read that address. So that's like a 100% overhead, right? Instead of one, I'm, I'm doing it twice. So each memory access requires another memory access to look at the page table, which is 100% overhead. I need to be able to reduce this. And I put, reduce this by putting extra hardware cache in the CPU for caching the page, page table itself, right? So instead of doing cache dynamic RAM, we are doing a cache for the page table. And it is called a translation local side buffer or a translation cache or a page table cache, right? Uh, so there are three names for this. Translation local side buffer is the most commonly used term. TLB uh, uh, is the most used term, but it is also called translation cache or a, a page table cache. The only purpose is this, right? I need to be able to do that translation fast. That's it. Um, and in terms of hardware, I'm doing the same thing. I'm putting extra hardware uh, close to the CPU. It is fully associative cache. What does that mean? That means that for each mapping, as I'm moving the mappings in and out of the TLB, when I'm bringing a new mapping, page number to physical uh, frame number mapping, into the TLB, that mapping can go anywhere in the TLB. It is fully associative. Uh, let's see. Full TLB, translation look aside buffer, uh, better name translation cache or a page table cache. But TLB is the name. So, almost everything is the same except we have added a TLB in, in, in the middle here, right? So, CPU generates a 32 bit virtual address. That is your virtual address. Here is your physical address, here is your physical memory, here's your disk, here is your page table. We have seen these before. The only thing that we have not seen is the TLB over here, right? So TLB on an extra hardware close to the CPU in order to make the translation really quick. 
so that I don't have to look at it in the page table and have a memory access. So in this case, what is going to happen? CPU generates our, your 32-bit virtual address. I will not look at the page table for the translation. Instead, I'll look at the TLB. And in the TLB, again, I have a valid bit, dirty bit, tag, because of there are groups of uh, mappings that you can bring in and out of the TLB. And then you have the corresponding frame number. So if you have the valid bit as one, that means that the TLB has the mapping, you get the frame number, offset, page offset carries over, and you will be able to access that particular frame, uh, uh, that particular frame number or the physical address, return that information to the CPU. If you have a TLB miss, then you go look in the page table. Go look in the page table. Again, two possibilities, valid bit could be a one, could be a zero. If it is a one, then you get the frame number. If it's a zero, then you need to deal with a page fault. Do the disk swap space, bring in the physical memory, update the page table, and so on. So look in the TLB first for the translation. This is for the translation. And if you do, if you you can, if you have a hit, TLB hit, you have the frame number. And if you have a TLB miss, you are going to look in the page table. And if you have the frame number, that's good. But if you do not have that uh, valid bit is zero, then you are going to have to deal with the page fault and um, use the swap space to uh, get in the, the new frame in the physical memory in that case. Now, here is where you, you put everything together, the TLB, the cache, and the virtual memory. Because you are, you are going to mainly have uh, two options. One is look up the TLB first. So, CPU is generating a 32-bit or whatever bit virtual address, and I'm going to look at the TLB first for the mapping. That's one approach. But as soon as I go through the TLB, what do I have? I have the physical address. Using that physical address, I can do the cache, memory, blah, 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 right? Go down the hierarchy for the information at that physical address. So in this case, you would need to map the cache with the physical address rather than the virtual address. You see, you go to the TLB first, get the mapping, you got the physical address, using that physical address, that's how your cache and your physical memory and your hard disk are based off of the physical address. So do the TLB first, do the translation first. That's one option. And I hope you guys agree that in this case, cache must be mapped to a physical address, right? Because if you're trying to access cache after TLB, you already did the translation. So you, now you are in the physical, you, you're talking physical address now. So that's one option. The other option is look up cache first. So cache, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with the cache first, you're doing the translation later. So cache is now mapped to a virtual address, not a physical address. So cache in this case is mapped to a virtual address rather than a physical address. After you do the cache, then you do the, uh, um, if you don't find things in the cache, then you look to do the translation. So then you do the TLB and then uh, look at it in the dynamic RAM. You guys see what the difference is between the two options? Yeah? One is do the translation first. Second is no, look at the information. If, if it's there in the cache, you don't even need to do the translation. Uh, if it's not there in the cache, then do the translation, then look it up in the physical memory. Yeah? All right, we'll focus on approach number one. Let's try to see what the complete process is when you look up the TLB first. So when you look up the TLB first, so this is what you're generally doing, right? You're looking at the TLB, you may have a hit or a miss. In, in any case, you translate the virtual address to a physical address. Then you use that physical address to deal with the cache and the physical memory and, and the hard disk. So TLB, when you're looking at TLB, you can have a hit or a miss. If you have a TLB hit, that means that the translation information is present. This is going to give us our physical address, which comprises of two things. What? Frame number and the page offset. I have a quick question about this. The page size is one kilobyte. 
what is the frame size? One kilobyte, right? So pages and frames, the number of pages and frames can be different. However, each page, it's same page offset, right? So the page offset, if it's 12 bits over here, it's 12 bits over here, right? So the size of the page, no matter where it is, it is the same. So if it's one kilobyte in the virtual space, everywhere it is the same. Next, uh, what do you have? Okay, so TLB hit gives us the physical address. Next, uh, let us see. Next, see if the word is in the cache or not. Right. So once you have the physical address, look at that physical address in the cache. Note that the cache is mapped to a physical address as then virtual address. We talked about this earlier as well. Then you don't find it in the cache. Then you look at it in the main memory or if hard disk and so on. Go down your levels of memory hierarchy. If you look in the TLB for the translation and you have a miss, that means that the page table entry needs to be looked at now. So get, you are going to miss the TLB Look at the page table in the main memory, which means what? You already have a memory access. Uh, then that is going to give us uh, our translation. Oh, that is going to give us our translation. Use that to deal with the cache. So let's take a look at the complete flowchart about how things are going to go. At the top over here, this is option one. We are looking at the TLB first. Virtual address generated by a CPU. You access the TLB to get the mapping. You may have a TLB hit or you may have a miss. If you have a TLB miss, then you deal with the TLB miss exception, which is go look at it in the page table, bring that page table entry into the TLB to eventually get your uh, mapping to the physical address. So all of that is captured in the TLB miss exception as a TLB miss exception. But if you do have a TLB hit, which means that now I have a physical address, then the question is, are you trying to write or are you trying to read? Because they're all protected uh, uh, because of the uh, sharing of the memory space by different programs. If you're trying to write, then you check for is the write access bit on for that particular address. If it is no, then you deal with write protection exception. If it is yes, then you try to write the data to the cache. Well, now you're trying to write data to the cache, you can have a cache hit or you can have a cache miss. But the, the place where you're trying to write, it may be in the cache, it may not be in the cache. If it is in the cache, then you write the data in the cache, update the dirty bit to let the lower levels of memory know that you have messed around with that particular address and then put the address and uh, put the data and the address into the right buffer. I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this last step in a little bit. That is when you have a cache hit, right? When you have a cache hit, you have that you are writing the data into the cache, you're updating the dirty bit, and then you're putting the data and address into the right buffer. If you have a cache miss with the physical address, if you have a cache miss, then you're stalling while you read the block from the lower levels of the memory into the cache, and then you can eventually write the data into the, the cache. Next, if you're not interested in writing, you're just interested in reading, try to read the data from the cache. Again, cache hit or cache miss. If it is a cache hit, then they deliver the data to the CPU. If you have a cache miss, then you stall while you read the block. And so bringing the information from the lower levels of the memory, main memory to cache or hard disk to cache and so on, a hard disk to main memory to cache and so on. Uh, but you stop doing this loop when there's a cache hit and then you deliver the data to the CPU. Next, I wanted to spend some time talking about this right buffer here. Whenever you are dealing with cache, you can do a few things. One is write through cache. Write through cache means, uh, suppose you, are, you have, you're trying to uh, update some byte in a particular word. Uh, what do you do? You look at it in the cache. You may find it, or you may need to bring that into the cache. But the, the writing operation happens where? The writing operation happens in the cache. Once you write in the cache, you also need to write in the lower levels of the memory in order for all the memories to be consistent. But when do you choose to write it 
to the lower levels of the memory. You may choose to do that immediately, or you can use the write buffer to do it. Meaning, I will just write it, I, I will not write it to the uh, dynamic RAM, I will not write it to the hard disk, I will just put that information onto a write buffer so that that information can go to the lower levels at a later time, independently. I can continue using my cache for other purposes, right? It is relieved from those duties. So write buffer is used for that. A write through cache specifically updates the next lower level immediately. So you update the cache, you write to the cache, and because it's a write through cache, you also update that information in the dynamic RAM. The only one level, level lower. Um, there is also a write back cache. Write back cache is, I will not do write through, I will not update the next lower level immediately. I will not put the information on write buffer. Instead, what do I do? I will keep the information in the cache, but only when the block of memory from the cache goes back to the lower level, depending on the dirty bit, only then I will update it in the main memory. So only when the thing has to go back into the main memory, only then you update the entry in the lower level. So that's called a write back cache. So you have, you have a few options with the, uh, when do you update it in the lower levels? All right, let's, uh, calculating the speed, TLB hit because I'm looking at it uh, in the, T the translation first, in the TLB. So we are using TLB hit, the access time is T nanoseconds. If you have a TLB hit, then you have the physical address. Using that physical address, you can look at it in the cache. So again, you can have a cache hit or a cache miss. If you have a cache hit, that means that you are going to need T plus C nanoseconds as the access time to get that particular uh, frame. Next, TLB hit, so you got the mapping, but you had a miss in the cache. If you have a miss in the cache, that means you spent T nanoseconds for TLB hit, you spent C to check if it's in the cache or not, but you're gonna to have to act, because you have a cache miss, you're going to have to access the physical memory, the main memory, right? That's M nanoseconds. That's going to be your access time there. Now, going back to the top, if you had a TLB miss, the translation is not available. Need to look at it in the page, uh, page table in the memory. Page table in the memory is going to have 2M plus T. One is going to be because of the, uh, one M is going to be because of the translation lookup. The other M is going to be for the data lookup. And then plus T is because you spent time doing checking whether it was in the TLB or not. TLB miss, then you have to deal with a page fault, which is going to be a really huge time in comparison. So we are approximating that to be T nanoseconds, which is sort of going to uh, dominate all the other access times. Now, the next question is, when do you bring a page into memory? So you have things in the hard disk, you have certain frames in the physical memory, when do you bring it? One option, which is sort of obvious here, is demand paging. You need it, you bring it, right, on demand. So page is brought into the memory only when it is referenced. I need to just figure out which page to bump off from the physical memory, uh, and I can do that by using some algorithm, we'll topic of our next lecture. But Demand paging is going to be, you need it, you tell me you need it, you reference it, and I will bring it from the hard disk into the physical memory. That's your demand paging. Pre-paging is do it ahead of time. So pre-paging is page brought into memory before it is referenced. So what are going to be some trade-offs because of this? So there are two options, right? Demand paging and pre-paging. Demand paging, only when you need it, you tell me I'll get it for you. Pre-paging, do it ahead of time. So what are the trade-offs here? Go ahead. Right, so you are going to, because you are doing it on demand, you are going to spend a lot of time accessing 
uh, memories, you're going to have a longer access memory access time for demand paging compared to pre-paging, right? So you, you save some access time. What is the problem with pre-paging? You got some pages for a particular program from hard disk to the main memory, right? You pre-paged it. But you may have had to estimate that, right, information. You don't know it, so you estimated it. Well, if you estimate it, there are some chances that a page comes into the physical memory and never gets used, right? So pre-paging has that problem where you are bringing in pages to the physical memory from the hard disk, which may never get used. So that's the problem. So th th those are your so sort of trade-offs between demand paging and pre-paging. But this is a practical solution. Whenever a program starts, we will adopt the strategy of pre-paging because when a program starts execution, its initial few steps are very uh, easy to determine. So you can use pre-paging for that. Bring in the uh, pages at the start of the program. You start off with the pre-paging. Pre-paging when the process is first created because it is easy to know what the first few steps are going to be. Next, when the process is swapped back in, suppose the process got suspended and it has to restart. When it restarts, the set of pages bought in are part of the working set of a process. What is a working set? Working set is sort of a time window. I was accessing page one, two, three, and seven, five, seven, right? So that's like a, your working set within the last six page accesses, which pages did you access? That's like a working set. So only those pages are swapped back in. After that, you do a demand page. So three items. One is, what should you do as a practical solution at the start of the process? Well, at the start of the process, it is easy to determine which pages to bring in. So let's use pre-paging. Next question is, what if the process got suspended and has to restart. When it restarts, you already knew the working set, right? When it left, when it got suspended, it had a working set of pages. So only those pages, let us do pre-paging for those pages. But in either case, once you're done with that pre-paging for the initial step, then you do the demand paging after that. That's a practical solution. All right. That is all I have for you guys uh, for virtual memory. You guys can do the activity now. It's gonna be a very simple one. Um, in the next class, we will talk about page replacement algorithms. It is going to be like a really straightforward lecture next one. Um, very systematic approach to page replacement. Uh, and then we'll talk about frame allocation, cache coherence, very interesting ideas about memories coming up. Uh, our exam is also coming up, looks like, next Thursday, huh? Next week, not this week, next week, Thursday. So we have uh, a couple of classes before that. So July 29th is our second exam. Um, it's going to essentially, uh, whatever we cover by Thursday of this week, that's going to be there. Right? So whatever we talk about Monday next week, not gonna be there. Uh, so page replacements is gonna be there, is, is what I'm trying to say, go ahead. The semester, yeah, yeah, yeah. So final exam at, at the end of the semester, last day when we meet, uh, exam two, Thursday of next week, July 29th. I've already started a Piazza section for exam two. I put in a back exam over there so, so that you guys can start looking at that. Logistics are gonna be exactly the same as before. Uh, I'm gonna have, say, 20 exams for people who wanna come in and do it. Uh, people who want to be online can be online. So ex logistics wise, exactly the same as exam one. Okay, I will stop recording here. I have not looked at the chat box today at all. Uh, where is this? Okay, then I look at chat. Okay, nobody asked, okay. Uh, then I do stop sharing, yes.